and then I'll let you be dismissed. Hebrews 12 is where I want you to go, word of the Lord. If you believe the word of God is about to feed you, would you shout amen? And I am certainly of the fundamental understanding that any Bible preaching should actually come out of the Bible. And that's why I'm, I'm such a proponent on you bringing the Word of God with you to the house of God, either opening it up or turning it on, right? I don't care how you have it, have it. There's something powerful about the written Word of God being in your very eyes. And I know this year, back in you know December, we started this journey on how many people were going to read the Bible so much. And, and so many people have done this. And I know some of you perhaps got a little discouraged. and Maybe you gave up. Look, mash the gas. I don't care if you just get through it one full, complete time. Do it. Be able to one day pillow your head before you cross over and say, You know what? I read the Bible from cover to cover. And I'm not ashamed that I'm a better person because of it. I know not everybody's going to read it at my speed. And, and the the number level at, at which I and other people, by the way, that I'm meeting all over the country, even some people in the tent reading the Bible at an extraordinary rate. And it's just been, it's, it's been phenomenal. So I know every week we don't talk about it. And it's been a little while since we've mentioned it, but I want you to mash that gas. I want you to get in the word of God. We're a people of the book. We're a people of the Bible. If you don't want to be deceived by what's about to happen over the course of the next couple of months, you're going to have to get your nose out of the newspaper and stick it in the Bible. You're going to have to get in a secret place. Father, which sees you secretly, shall reward you openly. And you're going to have to have a real concerted, conscious, secret time with the Lord. Does that make sense? You're going to have to make it a priority in your life. The Bible doesn't say seek him second, third, fiftieth, or a hundredth. He said seek him first. And when you seek him first, every other thing in life will be added unto you. And the every other thing is not your Christmas wish list. It's food, shelter, and clothing. Now, he may give you a wish list because he's a good God and he gives us things we do not deserve. He'll give you the desires of your heart, Psalm says. And he'll know that there'll be those desires because he'll put those desires in your heart because if you walk with God, you'll never have a desire that's not his desire. Can I get an amen right there? But he will take care of your abundant, evident, daily needs. So in a moment, we're going to jump into Hebrews chapter 12 and I want to preach on something that the Lord has really birthed in my heart uh, in this this season uh, that our church has been in and that our family has been in. And I'm going to preach today. I don't know if we can figure out how this thing keeps on dropping out, guys. If we can keep that up, be good. But I'm going to preach today on the blessing of endurance. The blessing of endurance. So in a moment, I'm, I'm going to read, but I want to, I want to release a couple of things. Uh, just as we were worshiping, I, I felt some things heavy in my spirit. I just, I just want to uh, speak over a few folks. Some I know and some I don't. But I just, I just feel like the Lord wants me to say it. Uh, gentlemen here in the second row with the, the blue shirt and the tie. I don't know who you are. But I feel like the Lord uh, wants me to tell you that you're in a moment right now of real separation from some people in your life. It seems like the Lord is kind of whittling down your crowd a little bit. I don't know what that looks like. And uh, he's taking some people out of your life that have been very valuable, very, very helpful. But he wants me to remind you that the people that got you where you are are not always the same people that are going to get you where you're going. And I just, when we were worshiping, there was just something over you. And the Lord was just saying, just remind him that in this time of separation, he's been losing a little bit of sleep, but he's going to gain some lifelong friends that are going to challenge him and take him to the next level of where the Lord wants you to go. And so just embrace the fact that there's going to be some people that walk away, but God's about to do something in your life because of that separation. Amen. Give him some praise in his house. I want to speak a word over one of our very faithful families, the Booker family. I was seeing you just a moment ago. You don't have to stand or anything. But when we were worshiping, I felt like the Lord gave me the word turbulence. I feel like things have been turbulent with you lately. And I'm not, we don't talk a whole lot, but I feel like things have been turbulent. And when we, were, when we were worshiping, it was like the Lord gave me an open vision of an airplane that is going to withstand the turbulence and it's very soon going to safely land on the ground and you're going to look back and say, thank God for the turbulence because it, it helped us. It transitioned us. But here's what's interesting. When, when I saw this, uh, you, sir, were in, in the main pilot seat, but you didn't land the plane. She did. She was the key to some turbulence that you're going through right now. And God's going to give her wisdom that's going to be imparted to you. And I'm telling you, God's about to land the plane. And I feel that with all of my heart. Amen. So, fellas, make sure you have a holy spirit and a holy wife. Amen. 
Where's Josiah? I saw him down here worshiping a minute ago. Where's, where's, uh, where's WrestleMania? There he is right there. Stand up just for a second, would you, Josiah? I didn't make everybody else stand, but you're young, so I'm going to make you stand for a minute. And, and you know, I don't release things like this all the time. I'm, I'm no, you know, Pastor Brian. I'm no Joseph Z, and I, I, I don't try to be. But when the Lord tells me something, he tells me something. I feel like the Lord, when you are worshiping, not only is he pleased with you, but I feel like the Lord said, I want him to know that either if it's happened now, I'm not sure, but it's about to happen. You're about to have two opportunities that are going to be afforded to you. I don't know if they're jobs. I don't know if they're trips. I don't know what they are. But there's going to be two opportunities that's going to be presented. And the first one's going to look better than the second one. But the second one is of the Lord. The first one's a distraction. I don't know what that means. Does that resonate with you? All right. So there's, all right, so there's two opportunities. The first one looks better than the second one. But the first one is a distraction. The first one is a distraction. I believe it's of the Lord that you take the second one. Let us know when that comes to pass. And, uh, and I just want to say uh, to our happy couple right here, Randy and Tiffany, stand up. We got them married this morning. Amen? They got married at 930 just before church. I told him, I said, I know you just got married, but I'm still going to preach a while. Amen? It don't make no difference. You can go on your honeymoon when I get done. Amen? Isn't that a blessing? Thank you for staying. Thank you for being here. Well, unless the Lord gives me some more, that's all I got this morning. Amen. I'm just going to give you the word of the Lord. And uh, Hebrews chapter 12 is where we are. And I'm going to pray. Thank you, brother, for sticking with me there for a little bit. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray that now your word will be released over all of us. Lord, use me as a conduit of grace, a conduit of courage, a conduit of mercy, but, oh, God, a conduit of truth. May today the word of God be exalted in such a way that the presence of God falls in this house and we're never again the same. Give us today a heart for the blessing of endurance. Lord, you said when we endure, we will be blessed. Lord, I pray that today you would help us to understand that it's always, always too soon to quit. Because the real blessing comes on the other side of the blistering and the burden and weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So speak to the hearts of your people today in Jesus' mighty name. And the church said, amen, amen and amen. Let's get right into Hebrews chapter 12. We have several things I want to unpackage in our hearing and I want to try to get down to at least verse number four if we can. We'll see what the Lord will give us. The Bible says, wherefore, would you shout wherefore? Whenever you see a wherefore or a therefore in the Bible, always look and see what it's there for and wherefore, right? There's a reason that he says wherefore. It means what he just spoke about is setting up the context for what he's about to speak about, all right? That's just simplistic English language. Wherefore, seeing, we also are compassed about, surrounded about, with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, look at me. Now, I don't know what things look like in heaven because I've not been there and come back and had a movie or wrote a book about it, right? But what I do know is that people in heaven are not consumed with what we're doing on earth. They're consumed right now in the presence of Jesus Christ. So many times... We've used this passage to console people in a moment of death or bereavement. And I get it. It's a great application, but I don't think it's the right interpretation. And we say, well, you know, the Bible says that grandmama is rooting us along. You know, the Bible says there's this cloud of witnesses and old Papa's rooting us along. I, I hope that he is, but I think Papa's not too worried about what Greggy's doing. I think he's in the presence of Jesus and he's consumed and mesmerized in the presence of Jesus Christ. So when this passage is referring to a great cloud of witnesses, it's the reason we don't want to skip over the first word of the verse, wherefore. Because he's not referring to a heavenly grandstand of your former pastor that's in heaven rooting you along and your grandmother rooting you along and your mom and dad rooting you along. I hope they are. I can't say as to whether they are or they're not. What I can say is that not what this verse is talking about. He's referring to the previous chapter, which is 40 verses long, and it's all verses about people that turned the world upside down by faith. And by the way, it wasn't their faith that was great. It was the object of their faith that was great. Because if you trust in a man, you'll get what a man can do. But you trust in Almighty God, you'll get what only Almighty God can do. And he can do exceeding abundantly above all we ever ask or think. Do you believe it this morning? 
So when he says, wherefore seeing we are compassed, surrounded about with a great cloud of witnesses, he was referring to the previous verse saying, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Samson, Jephthah, Deborah, Ruth, Esther, Moses, Noah, all of these great men and women, by the way, of God in 40 verses, they went before us and what they did is a witness to how we're supposed to live right now. That's what it means, a great cloud of witnesses. So what we cannot disrespect is what they did in order to leave us a pattern for how we are to live our life. You see, generationally, we go through different heroes, right? Your kids go through a Batman phase. Your kids go through a Superman phase. And then they go through a a Michael Jordan phase. And then they go through a whatever this singer is phase or this movie star phase. And they're like, oh my goodness, I I gotta make sure that I have a picture of Michael Jordan on my wall because he can jump 10 foot. Jesus jumped 10 foot, kept right on going up to heaven, praise God, went all the way up in the ascension. I want my kids to worship Jesus, not man. I want my kids to worship Jesus, not the great cloud of witnesses. The great cloud of witnesses are not there for us to worship. The great cloud of witnesses are there for us to be reminded of who they did worship. And they were willing to be shot and killed and sawed asunder. We think we know what spiritual persecution is. You better buckle up. We've not seen anything yet. I'm telling you, it's coming at an alarming rate. And what I am sick of is the lukewarm church is cheering it on. Listen. I I, I don't have time to get into the whole Republican, Democrat, but hear me and hear me well. Do not vote for someone because you hate for, you hate someone else. Vote for a love of God, a love of the Bible, a love of life, a love of Israel, and a love of all things freedom because I'm telling you, we are just a couple of years away from losing everything we have in this nation. And I know people just sit around like a bump on a log and fiddle while Rome's burning and acts like that's no big deal. But I'm telling you, spiritual persecution is coming. Religious persecution is coming. Stop having this escapist mentality that God is not going to let you suffer any persecution. There's not a preacher in the Bible that didn't suffer persecution. Is God going to have to apologize to them because we just get snatched out of here and we don't have to deal with it? You better roll up your sleeves, get ready to get your hands dirty because there's two kingdoms that are on a collision course and I want to make sure I'm on the right side of the kingdom and the right side of history. Amen. And these witnesses were slain for their faith, martyred for their faith, butchered, disemboweled for their faith. And we're like, oh my goodness. Somebody unfriended me on Facebook because of my spiritual belief. They should, if you're spiritual. If your brand of Christianity does not make your lukewarm friends nervous, I question your brand of Christianity. You know what I don't do? I don't have any lukewarm people wanting to go to dinner with me. They never ask. I don't have any people that are living in gross, wicked sin that text me or call me, because those people don't have my number anyhow, and they're like, hey, pastor, let's just go hang out for a little bit. No, I'm going to hang out with people that are on fire for God more than I am, love the Bible more than I do. They have more wisdom than I do. They are not going to be lukewarm, nominal, average Christians. We are disrespecting the great cloud of witnesses by laying down on the job and not witnessing. Because we're afraid of being offensive. I'm not afraid. I'm afraid of not being offensive. I'm afraid of not making a few of you mad every now and again. I'm afraid everybody's going to like me. I'm going to make sure they don't. And that's not been real hard lately. But these people were sawn asunder. These people literally had their eyes gouged out with hot pokers. These people had their arms sawed off. And by the way, lest you think that's just a Hebrews understanding, Hebrews 11 of what happened in the Old Testament, it's happening right now in Islamic nations all over America, in Hindu areas all over America. And the problem is this woke, liberal, lukewarm crowd is cheering it on in the name of diversity in our nation. You see, you say amen a few minutes ago. Diversity is the Trojan horse to terrorism. Do you hear me? 
You think he's cute now? Well, I don't want to seem xenophobic. You better seem something. Because after they destroy Israel, they're coming to your front door. You hear what's going on in Hendersonville, Tennessee? How many live in Hendersonville? Anybody live in Hendersonville? Anybody? I ain't even got, okay, I've got a few people living in Hendersonville. It's a great place, beautiful place, growing place. It's like a, it's like a this side of Franklin type of Nashville, right? It's growing, it's getting affluent. You know what they're doing now? By the way, uh, on one of the streets that we looked at, one of the original church buildings on, they got all of these complexes now, and they're emptying them out from people that pay their rent and pay their bills and pay their mortgage, and they're bussing all these migrants in to Hendersonville, Tennessee. You see, you thought it was in Aurora, Colorado. You thought it was in Ohio where they're eating cats. By the way, let me tell you something. They're not just eating cats. They're sacrificing them animals to the devil because this is a principality that's trying to take over this nation. This is a demonic situation that we are in. And I'm telling you, the devil is angry because the church is starting to wake up. And so my dear friend, Pastor Todd Coconato, he literally is fussing with the governor right now because it's happening in his hometown. We're talking about just across the water, friend. If there was a bridge, you could be in Hendersonville in 15 minutes. But there's not, so you've got to go around for 30. But nonetheless, it's happening. It's right now in, in, in Tennessee, Timbuktu, Tennessee. And everybody's like, well, you know, Pastor, you're just so crazy. You're just stirred up because it's an election year. You better believe it. Because I know people that call themselves believers that are about to vote your freedom away. You hear me? By the way, can I, can I say something because I love you? Some of you, you, you love God, and I, and I sincerely believe that. But you're like, well, you know, I just don't know if I want to go in the ballot box and choose between the lesser of two evils. If you're voting for two people, you're always going to be voting for the lesser of two evils. If I was on the ballot, you would still be voting for the lesser of two evils. That's just the facts. Okay, that's just the facts. But some of you are like, well, you know, I love God and I want to do my responsibility, but uh, I think I'm just not going to vote. A no vote is a her vote, a thousand percent. Huh? A no vote is a her vote. And that's just the facts. And by the way, I'm going to say one more thing because I got to get to the text. Okay, look, I got daughters I'm married to a woman. Thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you something. Did you know in the Bible, a woman political leader was a judgment from God? Show me one time it was a blessing. I know, I know, I chaps your hide, and I go, you just a misogynist. No, I'm just a realist. If you think a woman president is going to respond the same way as a man president, you need to stop smoking meth. It's not going to happen. She's not going to be calling the shots anyhow. Her earbud has Obama on the other end of it. But nonetheless, I just thought I'd talk a little bit today. Amen. I, I done went viral on TikTok, my son said, for politics, so I thought I'd just step into a little bit of it. I'm just saying, if you think, so about, think things are about to get easier, they're not. They're about to get a whole lot worse. It's about to get bad, 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 and people can hate me, but when I die, my kids will say, my daddy fought for my freedom. They pick those up before I stomp them, amen. So anyhow, I don't know where all that came from, but nonetheless, stop disrespecting the people of the past by trying to appease the people in the present. I don't care what they think about me. I don't care what they think about our church. I'm done with the whole crowd. It don't make no difference to me. I don't even answer the phone call no more. I do not care. They have been trying to interview me for two weeks. I've ignored every last one of them, and I will continue to do so. You know why? Because what they think about me and us doesn't matter to me anymore. It used to consume my thoughts, but it just does not matter because I play to an audience of one, and that's not you. That's him. So he said there's this great cloud of witnesses. Now it's preaching time. You can start timing me. Amen. That we've been compassed about. Now, because of that, because they've done their part, now we should do our part. Watch this. Let us lay aside every weight. Did you know spiritually, you and I need to be about some weight loss? Right? He's not just talking about physical weight loss, although that's a good idea for what's coming. You have to be able to run, praise God. But nonetheless, 
You better know something. You got some spiritual, religious weight that you're going to have to lose. Some of y'all got some spiritual water weight needs to go. You got some weights holding you down. I, I don't know what your addictions are. I don't know what your besetting things are. I don't know what your temptations are. And you don't know what mine are. So I'm not going to surmise and assume and guess. I'm just saying, when I make a statement like that, everybody in this room, including me, has some weight spiritually that must be shed. Whether it's an attitude, whether it's a situation of unforgiveness, whether it's a relational disconnection you're going to have to make, lay aside every weight, right? It's like you're trying to run with 10-pound weights on either leg. It just takes longer. It wears you down quicker. People are like, I just, I'm so tired. I'm so worn out. I'm so burnt up. What do I do? What do I do? Quit carrying things God never built you to carry. Take the yoke upon you which comes from him because he is easy and his burden is light. If serving Jesus is too heavy, I wonder are you serving Jesus because he said it was light because he's doing the big carrying. So there's some weight that we have to lay aside. But then notice how specific the context gets. And watch the next two words. The sin. Say the Sin. Now notice, he does not say, lay aside every weight and all the sins. No, no. Lay aside every weight and the sin. So there are many weights that hold us down. There's one sin that keeps us back. Now, you may say, well, yeah, you're, that's right. It's kind of like the gifts. There's one that always comes to the surface. And so I got this one sin that just always comes to the surface. That's not the context of what he's talking about. All of us have one issue that we need to deal with more than the other issues. That's why Paul said, this one thing I do, not 25 things I dabble in. Deal with one thing at a time. That's another message. But here he says, lay aside every weight, okay? That's plural. That's multiple. And the sin, that's not plural, that's singular. The sin which does so easily beset us. I am convinced and I believe that the, the nature of the text and the context bears this out. The sin is the specific sin that he just dealt with for 40 verses in the previous chapter. It is the sin of no faith. That's the sin. Because what is the one sin that kept them 40 years in the wilderness? Was it fornication? No, it was no faith. The Bible says they entered not in, Hebrew says, because of unbelief. Not because of idolatry, it was there. Not because of adultery, it was there. Not because of mismanagement of funds and greeds, it was there. But it was all there because of a lack of faith. You see, in the realm of money, you don't have a money issue, you have a faith issue. You see, we got to have enough faith to say, God, if it's really you, bid me to come on the water. Give me a reason to stretch my faith, Lord. And there are many weights, but the sin that's keeping you in the place where you are this moment is your lack of belief in God's provision. That is the sin which so easily besets us. Not a sin, there's many of those. The sin that holds you back is the sin of not believing God. Because he just, in context, referred to it in 40 verses. It's substantially the longest chapter in Hebrews. It is the third longest chapter in the entire 27 books of the New Testament. 40 verses. And from start to middle to climax to conclusion, it's about one thing. Faith, 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 faith. By faith, Noah. By faith, Moses. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Deborah. By faith, Esther. By faith, David. By faith, Samson. These lived in faith. These lived by faith. These all died by faith. These sin is having no faith. And by the way, what a ridiculous place to find ourselves because what are we saved by? Faith. So you mean to tell me, you can believe God for the transition of your soul from hell to heaven, from darkness to light, from death to life. You can believe God can save your carcass spiritually by faith. But you can't have enough faith God's going to pay your bills next week. I believe God's big enough to 
save me from hell. Cool, he can't save you from a low gas tank. What is our problem? Jesus said, if you have the faith as of a grain of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be removed and cast yonder into the sea, and it will be done. So my question, and I've asked you this before, but it's been a while, so put your elementary thinking caps on class. If mustard seed size faith can move a mountain, I wonder what watermelon size faith would do. Uh, uh, listen, if tiny faith can do it, what can majestic, miraculous, huge faith do? And by the way, again, it's not my faith, it's the object of my faith. See, if the object of my faith is this pulpit, this lectern, my faith will accomplish what this pulpit, this lectern can accomplish, which is zero to nothing. And so it is the object of your faith that is important. It's not a name it, claim it theological position. Well, you know, Jesus is a genie in a bottle and I want a Mary Kay pink Cadillac. I'm going to rub it in three times. Pop, he's going to pop out and give me a wish and I'm going to have it parked in my garage. No, no, no. There's a difference in faith and ignorance. Jesus is not a genie in a bottle. He's not a wish list. Okay? He's a God that wants to provide for the needs of his children and he proves himself by our faith in the fact that he can prove himself to be exactly who he said he is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy strength. Love thy neighbor as thyself, for this is the first and great commandment. How do you do any of that? You do it by faith. How are you saved? By faith. How does your home stay together? By faith. How do you give? By faith. You see, some of you don't give by faith. You give by a record book. And you're like, well, you know, the pastor's always talking about tithing and giving, and I tried it a couple times, and it just didn't work for me. You know why? That's because Verizon gets your first 10%. That's because your mortgage company at the bank gets your first fruits. That's because your child support gets your first fruits. No, the Bible says you give your first fruits. How do you do that? You do it by faith. If I lay out 10 $1 bills, you know the tithe is $1. Am I right? So the question is, of those 10 $1 bills, which one is the tithe? The first one you pick up and spend. So if you try to budget your kingdom giving, it's why you don't give. Because giving will never make sense. Because the sin that besets you in your finances is the sin of no faith. Am I making sense? But let's keep rocking through the text because there's a lot to say. So here's the sin of no faith. It easily besets us. But let us run, I like this, with patience. Those two words don't seem to go together. If you're running, you're probably not patient. But he says, look, as you're running, do it with patience. There's going to be obstacles that come your way. There's going to be things that happen. Maybe the building we're trying to purchase is going to take a little bit longer than we expected. What do you do? You keep running, but you do it with patience. You trust God. You believe God. You don't get mad. You don't suck your thumb. You don't sit on the sideline. Oh, my goodness. Okay, this ain't tag team wrestling. This is get in and go all out. You ain't got nobody gonna save you. Just stand up and fight, fight, fight for the glory of God. And so he says, let us run. He didn't say lay around on Sunday morning until the sun warms your feet. He said, you're gonna have to run. I think one of the great curses of the American church is the spirit of laziness and slumber. I was thinking about this yesterday. I got people all the time like, oh, you know, I'm just waiting for God to open a door. I'm waiting for God to open a door. I'm waiting. You've been waiting so long, you could have built a house and opened five doors for yourself already. Stop waiting for God to open a door. He says, run. You got a race to run. But watch what he says about this race. Run it with patience because I think that the terminology for patience would help us to understand theologically that you run with patience because God doesn't always call you to win. He calls you to finish. Okay? You don't win every race and you don't have to show up to every fight you're invited to. You run with patience, not so you can win every time, so you can finish every time. Because it's not how you start that really matters. It's how you finish that makes the difference. The race, watch this, that is set before us that is set before us. Now, here's what you have to understand. And we could go to other passages that Paul deals with in, in First and Second Timothy about running and about farming and about being a soldier and all of these things. But understand this about the race set before us. All of us, even those in denial, are in a race. Okay? Every one of us are in a race. But listen to me lovingly. You are not called to 
or judged by the results of my race. You're not called to run my race. I'm not called to run your race. That's why Paul very eloquently through Holy Spirit inspiration said in 2 Corinthians, when you compare yourself amongst yourselves, you are not wise. Why? Because if I compare myself to you, I will always find areas where I come up big and you come up short. But when you stop that and the measuring stick then becomes Jesus, we don't look so hot anymore. We're not so big and bad and bold any longer when Jesus is the measuring stick. So I'm not called to operate in your gift, nor are you called to operate in my gift. And I think the problem is there is so much competition and so little cooperation in the body of Christ. It's why churches in the same community can't even get along. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. I'm like, we love every gospel. Now, if you're a cult, you're a cult. We'll call you out, right? But we love every gospel preaching church in this town. But you know what we're not called to do? We're not called to be their church. We're called to be the church God wanted us to be. When the starter gun went off, pow, they go their direction, we go our direction, we're all in a race, but it's not the same race. You have a way that you have to run, I have a way that I have to run, we collectively and individually have ways that we have to run. Stop all this competition. Listen, my preaching is not in competition to somebody else's. Your worship is not in competition to somebody else's. Your giving is not in competition to somebody else. Stop comparing yourself. By the way, it is what I call pastoral pornography when churches that are struggling get on the internet and they start salivating at the mouth for some guy down the road that's got a thousand more people than they do. This is not a competition if God gives them more glory to God if we pray for revival and God sends it to the church down the road glory to God that's their race this is our race I'm not trying to be somebody else I'm not trying to run your race nor should you have to run mine I think sometimes there can be levels of intimidation in a church like ours let's just be honest People are like, well, you know, pastor's been preaching so long and you know, he gets up there and he just rants and man, I, I, just don't, I just don't think I could speak like him. Good, you're not called to. You'll have more friends if you don't. <laughs> you're called to preach the way God called you to preach. You're called to sing the way God called you to sing. You're called to teach the way God called you to teach. We got to get rid of the spirit of competition in the church. We're on the same team, church. That's why all this nonsense, well, when he gets sidewalks, we're going to show up and we're going to preach against his church. I'm like, who preaches against a church? Demons. That's who preach against a church. I'll post the video later this week. It'll be fun. But nonetheless, verse 2. Here's how you stay focused on your race. Say my race. race. Say my my race. That's your race. Here's how you stay focused. Looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith. Meaning by that, if he started the race, he'll help you finish the race. He's the beginning, the end, the alpha, the omega, and everything in between. He's the introduction, the climax, and the conclusion of every book that your life will ever be a part of. And you say, well, I'm just in a real bad chapter right now. That's okay. Don't throw the book out. Just turn the page. You're just in a turbulent chapter right now. Amen. Don't throw it away. Just turn the page. Just turn the page. And he says, here's how you stay focused. Look unto Jesus. He doesn't say, look unto the president. He doesn't say, look unto the pastor. Listen, I could stay on the phone 24 hours a day, seven days a week, feeding, leading, heeding, weeding, doing everything that I possibly can to help people in their life, and they would still have needs. You know why? I am not your savior. The government certainly is not our savior. The Democrats, the Republicans, Harris, Trump, they are not our Savior. we got to look to Jesus. Our problem is we're waking up, the first thing we're doing is looking to Twitter. What's trending? We're looking to TikTok. What are they saying? We're looking to Facebook. Can I be honest? If all you ever do is get your news from Facebook, you're a conspiracy theorist. Like a real one. All my conspiracies have come true, so I need more of them, praise God. But you're like a a real deal conspiracy theorist that believes crazy stuff. Like Jews are not really Jews. And stupid stuff like that, right? I'm going to run my race, Lord. I'm going to run my race, praise God. I'm just saying, people like, well, you know, it's like when people say, well, I read it on Google. 
I have them stand in the meet and greet line all the time. Well, you know, I wasn't going to come tonight and hear you preach because Google says you're worth $129 million. I said, yeah, Google says men can get pregnant. Do your diligence. Huh? Uh, Google will tell you that it's okay, that it's legal, and that it's logical for a running vice president, huh? A running vice president to put things in boys' bathrooms and locker rooms for when the boys have their period. And y'all think I'm crazy. Well, Google said this about you. Listen, if you get all your news from Google, if you get all your news from Mark Zuckerberg, if you get all your news from Elon Musk, you're as deceived and as confused as a termite in a yo-yo. No wonder you're as frustrated as a bald-headed hippie every time you wake up. You have no substance to what you believe. And listen, I'm going to run my race, and Jesus is going to be the focus of my finish. This crowd can try to distract us and discourage us and shoot us and belittle us and hate us. But at the end of the day, I'm looking unto Jesus. Because he started the race. He's going to help me finish the race. Now watch this. Who for the joy. Shout joy. That's a Milo word right there. Joy. Choose joy. It doesn't cost you a thing. But I'll tell you one thing. It's expensive not to choose it. Joy's free. Bitterness will cost you everything. You see, some of you are sick all the time, not because of what you're eating, because of what's eating you. You better choose joy. Matter of fact, shout choose joy. joy. That's what you better do. And if you got it, it's because you chose it. But nonetheless, it said, who for the joy, watch this, that was set before him. You know what was set before him? You ought to read Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. He walked through a butcher shop and called it joy. Who for the joy that was set before him. Now, my question has to be, why in the world would he call the cross joy? The same reason in Isaiah 53, the Bible says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. You know why? Because it didn't please the Lord to bruise you. You know what he was joyous over? Over the fact that you don't have to go to hell for the rest of your life and for all of eternity. He chose joy over the cross. He endured all the suffering so you wouldn't have to bust hell wide open with a broke back. He chose joy so that you would not have to die in punishment and bitterness of soul and agony where the worm dieth not, where they'll beg for a drop of water for eternity and not get a bit, a bit of satisfaction whatsoever. He chose joy that was set before him. Now watch what he does. He endured the cross. Now wait a minute. It says that the cross that was set before him was joy, but it does not say he enjoyed the cross. Don't have a sick mental persecution complex. It says he endured the cross, but he counted the endurance as joyous. And sometimes I look at social media and I'm thinking, do we even read the Bible? I mean, think about it. Now, now if, if the shoe fits, you can put it on. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying. Th- think about the people in your friends list, which it, it probably needs to be less than what it already is. But nonetheless, think, think about them for a minute. I've never in my life seen a generation, and I'm talking about even older folks that ought to know better, that do nothing but gritch and complain every day of their life. I'm over it. People are like, you never like my posts. I never look at them. Because it ruins my meal when I do. Makes my coffee taste bitter. Because I already know, you mad about something, you upset about something, you sideways about something, you don't like the way somebody looked at you, they didn't shake your hand, you blah, 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 whatever, and there's never any joy. It gets on my nerves. So you know what I do? I just ignore those kind of people. Now, why everybody's not saying amen is because some of you are under conviction right now because you're looking at your Facebook feed right now. You like deleting stuff while I'm preaching. Like, oh, I better get rid of that. <laughs> Preacher going to see that. Yeah, you just complain about everything. I'm like, dear Lord in the heavens, do you even believe that God is good? I'm like, if somebody didn't know anything about Jesus and nothing about social media 
and your feed was the only one they jumped on one day, they would, number one, know Facebook is demonic, and number two, would never get saved. Because you have no testimony whatsoever. You mad at every waiter and every waitress that gets your order wrong, and you have to post about it. I don't care what you ate for breakfast. I, I, I don't care that your Uber driver looked at you cross-eyed. He's driving. He shouldn't be looking at you know how. Uh, every time I turn around, your post is about how low your bank account is. How bad your boss is. How sick your pet is. Okay, look, if your pet's sick, put a picture of him. Say, would you lay hands on this picture and pray for my dog? That's fine. That's cute. But you ain't got to complain about everything that happens to you every single day. People are tired of it. And you wonder why you don't have no friends. Well, I go to church, nobody shakes my hand. He that hath friends must show himself friendly. I'm afraid to shake some of your hands. I'm like, dear God in heaven, what's going to rub off on me? These people trying to curse me, not trying to help me. There's some people I just got to steer clear of. It's kind of like, you know, when, when people leave the church for adverse reasons. By the way, we have people that leave the church for good reasons. We send them out. We honor them. We love them. They come to me and they say, look, we believe God wants us to transition. And I'm like, thanks be unto God. You did this the way the Holy Spirit wanted you to do. But you always know when somebody leaves the church bad. Because you know what? They don't even drink alcohol that I know of. But if they see me in Walmart, they'll run down the beer aisle so quick to get away from me. They don't know what to do. I'll come walking up in Walmart. Woo! They're running down the liquor aisle quick. Why? Because they just always mad about something. Please don't live life like that. If you don't get two things out of my message, get this one thing. Please live choosing joy. Please stop complaining so much about everything. Look, have you a group of people in your life that you can complain to and the whole world doesn't have to know about it? And if they're the right group of people, they'll do two things. They'll console you when you need to complain to them and then they'll convict you when you've done it too much and you need to shut up. Okay, it's just that simple. Have those, have a, I only have a handful of them. Don't have a whole bunch of them. You'll end up having a crazy deacon board, but nonetheless. Get you a handful of people that you can complain to and they'll be like, look, I love you, sister. I love you, brother. I get it. I, I'm, you know, we talked about accountability a couple weeks ago. Stood the men up, stood the women up. Everybody's on trial here, right? And so I said, look, get you some accountability. Have those people in your life that can pick you up when you're down, but keep you up before you go back down. I've got those people in my life and I thank God for them. They could, they could tell me the, the, the fruity tooty stuff and they can tell me, you, you're an idiot. And you know what? And I'll take it the same because they've earned that right in my life. Find some people in your life that have earned the right to tell you what needs to be told. Find those people in your life. They are valuable, valuable people. But nonetheless, he did not enjoy the cross. He endured it, but he counted it joy for your sake. What did he do? Despise the shame. He despised the shame. He said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He didn't look for that time in the future when it was going to be, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's not something that he was looking forward to. He just knew it was going to happen. So what did he do? He despised the shame that was coming his way and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, that's something that you and I don't get to do, but we get to go to him because he's already done it for us. The work is done. The work is over. He said, it is finished. John 19, 30. You don't add anything to that. You don't take anything away from that. You don't subtract from that. You don't divide from that. You don't multiply from that. What Jesus did was enough. We are not saved because of what we do. We are saved because of what Jesus has done for us. Religion is spelled D-O. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Christianity in the name of Jesus is spelled D-O-N-E. It's done, 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 done. But it was only done because he endured Remember what the people told him on the cross? If you're really who you say you are, well, why don't you call on God to save you, big boy? You know what he told his disciples before he even got there? Don't you think for a moment that I could not call and pray into my father and he would send me 10 legions of angels to destroy this world and set me free? But listen, he didn't come to stop short of his calling. He came to endure. To fulfill his calling. And some of you are going to have to learn the blessing of endurance. Because you, 
you've hit a wall and you've stopped. You've hit a ceiling and you've stopped. You've hit a roadblock and you've stopped. You've, you've hit a skiffle, a kerfuffle as we call them. And we're like, ah, you know, I just... And sometimes if we're not careful, we will second guess ourselves and the will of God. And by the way, you'll, you'll, you'll second guess yourself more often than you'll probably second guess the will of God. The reason you'll second guess the will of God is because you listen to too many people trying to talk you out of what the Holy Ghost already talked you into. Now, let me give you an example. When the shooting happened in the subsequent days, I've, I've really tried to st stay out of the, the, the media limelight because of it. Because it's a serious situation. It's not something you want to just glorify and talk about every five seconds of your life. But it's interesting how many people online, maybe even some good, sincere folks. And my friends didn't do this because they know better. They, they, they can hear from the Lord. But some people think they hear from the Lord. And I saw these videos. Well, you know what this was? This was a warning to Global Vision. This was a warning to Greg Locke. This was a warning to his family. Because God allowed this to happen to bring forth elements of disobedience. And I'm like, okay, throw in the Jake break, Skippy. Let me ask you a question. You're going to say that about the apostles and the disciples that all of them? All of them were eventually assassinated. Except John, they bowled him in chicken grease. I believe I'd take the assassination over that. But he did write 22 chapters of the book of Revelation, praise God, when his body was completely boiled over in that grease. And I'm thinking some people will sow things into your life to make you discount and dismiss what God's already put in your life. Make you start second-guessing yourself, right? I saw this post the other day. Well, you know why they're having such a hard time transitioning to a building. And I'm like, yeah, because people like you won't shut up on the Internet. That's probably why. But it's because the blessing of God has been removed. Let me tell you something. We have no screens we have a Yank sound system. Sorry, guys. Okay, it's just in place right now. We have people cutting the back out of the tent. It's about to be a silver tent, praise God. So many people are cutting pieces out of it. I don't care. Cut the whole thing down. We're selling the, 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 the parts that matter, not the vinyl. We're in here. Kids still running around. Right? Hot as blazes. Baptistry. Colder than a mother-in-law's kiss when you get in it this afternoon. And some of y'all going to get in it. But you know what? Blessing of God's still here. People still getting saved. Lives still getting turned around. Folks getting married. People getting words from the Lord. Deliverance taken. Things are still happening. There would have been a time I would have been like, oh, I, 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 I wonder if they're right. They're not. God's right. You see, the blessing comes in the endurance. If God just handed it to you on a silver platter, you wouldn't appreciate it. That, by, the, by the way, I, I love, listen, I love doing things for my kids. I, I mean, my kids are spoiled rotten. Now, we, we do have to be honest. The, the grandkid, he's like spoiled, 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 spoiled rotten. And that's just the way it's supposed to be. But look, at the end of the day, I still believe you cannot just hand your kids everything that you didn't have and expect them to know what to do with it. You just can't. Listen, Tobias is rent spoiled, but I'm not buying him a car next week. Okay, because he doesn't have the capacity and the ability nor a level of accountability or responsibility to be able to drive it. He can't even reach the seat and the pedals at the same time. And here's what we've done. We have raised a generation of kids. Matter of fact, it's been going on for a couple of generations. So now we have a generation of adults that disrespect all authority and burn down buildings, not even knowing why they're mad. Get on college campuses chanting against another nation they've never even visited, believing the lies of Google and the internet. And they are willing to allow this nation to be destroyed tomorrow and think they're doing everyone a favor in allowing it. Why? I'll tell you why. Because people that never fought battles to have what they have don't appreciate what they've got.
It's just the facts. Remember in the Old Testament, the Bible says that the older generation after 40 years died off and only Joshua and Caleb in that younger generation were able to cross the Jordan River in the book of Joshua and go into the promised land. And the Bible says everybody that went in was under the age of 40. So guess what happened when they got in? They disrespected the whole shebang. You know why? Because the generation that fought to get them there was already gone. But the generation that was handed the promised land didn't see it as a promise. And to this day, it's still a quagmire of a mess in the Middle East. Because the younger generation disrespected what they were handed and didn't understand the principle of fighting and sacrifice for it. And that's the fact. That's where we are right now in the American culture. See these videos? I mean, I can barely even watch half of them. Of these people just screaming into a camera, angry, mad, makeup just flowing everywhere. Hey, I mean, you can like see the demons coming out of their mouth. They're so mad. Ask them why they're mad. They can't tell you. Ask them what they're upset about. They can't tell you. Ask them about a policy that they're voting for. Well, they don't even know about policy. You know all they know? Orange man, bad. And I'm like, I thought y'all didn't make color an issue in this race. <laughs> Orange is a color. <laughs> but nonetheless, I'm thinking to myself, why is it that people disrespect the gift and glory of God? It's because they didn't fight for it. See, we're fighting for something here. So all this crowd saying, oh, no, 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 no. Don't listen to them. Endure. Change your phone number if you have to. Endure. Get a new friends list. Endure. Stay at it. Endure, endure, endure. Do you know what some of you need to do? I'm talking about later in life. Now, everybody knows I love to, to cycle. I'm, I'm 48 years old, and I, I pray I get to do it more and more and more, and I hope, can't wait to get settled so I can do it some more. But listen, I was almost 40 years old before I ever got on a bicycle. Like 39 years old. Now, I'd been on a little BMX when I was a kid, you know, you know growing up. And, and when I was a kid, we were like, oh, my goodness, I rode 52 miles a day on my BMX. If they had Strava back then like they do now, you would find out that you went like a quarter mile. It just seemed a, a long ways, right? Ride 50 miles on a bicycle, you'll know what it's like. So when I was almost 40 years old, I got on a bike, and I learned to be an endurance athlete, having never played basketball, baseball, football. I tried to play soccer when I went to uh, MJCA in the fourth grade, but I got 50 demerits the first semester and I got kicked out. And so at the end of the day, right? At the end of the day, I was never involved in any kind of running. I look at Dr. Malachi O'Brien setting the world record, run, 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 run. And I think that some of the things, even when I was, you know, 39, 40, 41, 42, all the way up to today, some of the things that I've done on a bicycle and I'm like, you know how I did that? Endurance. People hear the fantastical stories, and I'm like, look, it's not fantastical, and it's not a story. It's a real deal, Lucille. I have ridden a bike so hard, so long, with no sleep, that somewhere in the bare country of the mountains in the Rockies and Montana and all through the, somewhere at three or four in the morning, I woke up in the middle of a gravel road having no idea how I got there and how long I'd been laying there. You just eventually ride so much, you just fall asleep. And you get up. You know what wakes you up? You hear another cyclist pass you. You see, in the endurance cycling world, there's a phrase. Sleepers lose. So here's what happens. Everybody races. You know, Pastor Jesse's been getting into this stuff. We've been talking about, you know, Tour Divide and all this kind of stuff. He's been watching all these videos, getting in his blood system, right? People come out. I mean, the gun goes off. Woo! Everybody's wide slam open for 100 miles. But after 500 miles, everybody's going the same speed no matter who went out first. But here's when the real riders come out, when the sun goes down. And you endure through the night. I remember, and I'm just, I'm just chit-chatting with you because I got I, I to let you see this from an illustrative personal standpoint. You okay? I remember I'm in Canada. I'd been on a bicycle for less than two years, and they said, listen, they told me the year before, nobody's ever rode their bicycle across America in 10 days. I said, exactly, that's why I'm going to do it. 
I rode a road bike across America, 320 miles a day. Saddle sores bigger than half dollars on my rump. Had to stand up sometimes because sitting down felt like you was just sitting on razor blades for days. But after a few days, they numb up and scab up. You get some of that Ambisol. You know what Ambisol is, that tooth medicine? I learned a trick. Put some Ambisol <laughs> on them saddle sores. Numb the bum and pedal, 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 pedal. Huh? So I'm in Canada. I've been going all day long. I'm 200 miles in thinking it's going to get easier when it was just getting introduction. It's 3 in the morning. It's 18 degrees outside. And my tracker says to cut through a river. So I reset it. Hit it a few times. I'm like, oh, it's the, it's the weather. It's the temperature, you know. Beep, beep. Beep, beep. And by the way, if you go off track with even 100 yards, you're disqualified. You have to follow the same route everybody else does. And I'm like, it's 18 degrees. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm already cold. And I got to take my bicycle across a river? Yep. I could have been like, oh, spiritual persecution. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. I'm going to win. I'm crazy like that. I put my bike up on my shoulder. I pull my shoes off, put them up on the bike, hook them to the thing. I'm like, I'm just going to do this sock-footed. I don't want wet shoes for the next three days. 18 degrees. Waist-deep water. Three o'clock in the morning. Closest town is 175 miles away. What do you do? You just keep going. You endure. Makes for a good story. Makes for a good book. Makes for a good movie, right? You just endure. And you go through, and you go through, and you go through. And you're like, oh my goodness. Whew. I must be an elitist. And then all of a sudden you catch up to the people that did it 30 minutes before you did. It's about endurance. Some of you need to keep riding. Keep running. Keep pedaling. You know what Jesus said? Ask. Keep asking. Seek, keep seeking. Knock, keep knocking. You say, my business is not doing well. That's okay, endure. The church is not doing well. That's okay, endure. My marriage is not doing well. That's okay, endure. My kids don't seem like they're coming back to the Lord. Endure, endure. Keep praying, keep seeking, keep asking, keep giving, keep fasting. Keep praying, keep seeking, keep asking, keep giving. Keep fasting, keep knocking, keep knocking, keep knocking, keep knocking. You have to endure. There's a blessing of endurance. Not because you're called to win. You're called to finish. You're called to finish. So I raced in that particular race 850 miles. It's a 3,000 mile race, 2,800 miles. So I went 850 miles. I came over a hill going down a mountain. And I got distracted and I ended up hitting... My front brake, which is a no-no in the racing world. I'm probably going 35, 40 miles an hour down a mountain. I'm head over heels over the handlebars, landed on all the Gatorades that I had in my little stack here and it hurt my back, busted it all over the place, tore my bike to shreds. Closest bike shop was 35 miles behind me. I just left it. And in this particular race, you cannot get any help going forward or you're immediately disqualified. You can only get help going backwards and then come back to the place where you were. There's a tracker. They're watching you all the time. So I broke my wrist. I'm laying in the middle of the road. Other racers are going. They're not even stopping. It's self-supported. Sorry. See you next year, right? I'm laying on the road. I'm just, I'm crying. I'm broke all the pieces. I'm crying more because my race is done and my bike's broken. You see, a real cyclist knows that when you wreck, no matter how hard it is, the first question you ask is, is my bike okay? Is my bike okay? Right? That's just what you do. Even when you get hit by a car, yeah, is my bike okay? And so I'm looking around, I'm like, it's trash. I'm done. You know, people at the church watching the blue dots, and I'm like, man, they, I'm so embarrassed. I'm going to have to quit. I've only made it 850 miles. It was the hardest 850 miles of my life, by the way. So the Lord reminded me, look, you can't get help going forward, but you can help get help going backwards. So I got my bike, and I began to push it backwards. 
the direction I just came until some crazy group of teenagers come flying out of the woods in a legal dope-smoking state. Smell like Cheech and Chong rolling up to my bicycle. And they said, you need help? I said, I need a bike shop. <laughs> if y'all can get me there in one piece. So I hopped in and they took me that 30, 35 miles back into that town. I called a buddy of mine and I said, man, my bike is busted. My body's busted and my bank account's busted. I need my bike fixed. He got on the phone, gave me his credit card number, said, do whatever this pastor needs. They fixed my entire bike. Then the bike shop owner took me 35, 40 miles back to where I was, where I had the wreck, parked me there and said, enjoy yourself. I took a broke wrist, laid it up on top of a handlebar. And raced through the roughest country that would tear up a D12 tractor for 850 more miles with a broke wrist. Every pedal stroke was the most painful imaginable. Every vibration shook my wrist. Well, I promised the church I wouldn't miss more than two Sundays. I'd never done that before, right? And so wrecking cost me an entire day to rebuild the bike. I had to go so much slower, twice as slow as I was going before. And so by the time I get almost the 1,700 miles, I thought, man, in order for me to finish, I'm going to have to go another week and and miss an entire other Sunday. So I did a little video and I said, man, I'm going to have to scratch. That's the worst thing in the world. You know, they put it all over the world. Oh, did not finish DNF. And so I came home. That was in 2015. By the way, that was the race when our Facebook page blew up. I had done a video called I'm Coming Out of the Closet, and I put it on that page. I left, go to Banff, Canada to to race down to Mexico, and while I was gone, that video went to like 8, 10 million people, whatever, and so we we left with 4,000 followers, came back with 55,000 followers, and uh, Facebook gave us a blue check mark and has ruined us ever since, but uh, nonetheless, that was in 2015. 2015. And you know what's crazy? I don't know if there's been a week, even when I don't ride consistently, I don't know if there's been a week since 2015 that I've not told myself, by the time you're 50, you need to go back and finish that race. You you, you need to go back. And everything in my mind and my body and my numb bum says, "Mm mm-mm. But everything in my spirit of endurance says, yes, sir. So whether I ever do or not is not the point. The point is, I'm not the guy to talk with about how hard things are and you're going to quit tomorrow. I'll try to have compassion on you. But until you rub an ambisol on it, I don't really care. (laughs) Huh? What am I saying? Endurance is a blessing from God. You've got to endure church. I know it's hard. I know you're tired. I know you're scared. I know you're full of fear. I know that the devil's thrown everything at you. But the prize for Jesus came when he endured. We could keep going in the text. I don't believe there's any reason to because I I just feel a sweet spirit of the Lord just really resting on some people today. Let me get the pianist up here. I want to say this. In Matthew chapter 24, and there's a lot in the Bible, by the way, about endurance. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 17, it's right in the middle of a passage on the end times, which we're gearing up for very quickly. So pay attention, because it's coming to a town near you. (laughs) Jesus begins to talk about the wars, the rumors of wars, the nation rising against nation, and the kingdom against kingdom. And by the way, there are many nations, but there's only two kingdoms. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. And a line's been drawn in the sand, figure out which one you're on. But after he begins to illustrate all of that, and he talks about the love of many growing cold, and he talks about the fact that there will be family members that will turn you over to the authorities thinking they're doing God a favor. There'll be hurt, ridicule, persecution, false things said about us. 
people walking away. Churches folding. Compromise on the rise. Courage on the demise. Jesus said it's all going to happen. And he said that's just the beginning of sorrows. Just the introduction to it. But then he said this. In Matthew 24, after revealing all of that, he says, and he that endureth unto the end shall be saved. Who shall be salvaged from such discouragement and despicable things? Those that keep peddling. Those that don't hit the snooze button for the next 45 minutes. But they get up and they condition themselves. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And I want to say some of you are captive in your own body because your flesh tells you how to live your life. Your flesh does not want you healthy. Your flesh does not want you wise. Your flesh does not want you blessed of the Lord. Your flesh wants you looking at pornography. Your flesh wants you to be filled with lust and temptation. Your flesh wants you to fill your body and every cavity of it with all the garbage you possibly can. And then you sit back eating complete trash and wonder why you feel like garbage. Some of you cannot tell your body no. And it's a shame and it's a sin. Because he that endureth to the end should be saved. If you can't push away from a meal, you won't go to the guillotine and let them cut your head off for Jesus. Huh? If you're not disciplined enough to go on a walk, to do a push-up, to actually go to the gym and quit bailing out, man, I'm glad he's quiet up in his house now. There's some conviction settling in here. Some of y'all need a spirit of endurance. Some of y'all even older in life. I'm, 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 I'm growing up in there. I'm getting there. Listen, I don't care how old you are, how young you are. Some of you need to write down this week a goal on a piece of paper that is absolutely impossible for you to achieve without God's grace and without pain, suffering, lack of sleep, and endurance. Did you know there are people in this room right now? I'm going to inspire somebody right now. I don't know who you are. You may be 60 years old. You may be 70. You may be 20. You may be 18. You may be 30. You may be 48. I don't know who you are. You may be 37, however old you are. There are people in this room right now. You know what God's doing? God said, look, I will spiritually enrich you and enliven you if you will take your health seriously. There are people in this room right now, you're a couch potato, and by this time next year, you're going to be running a marathon for the glory of God. I'm telling you right now, it's going to happen. All you got to do is make that decision. I'm going to get up. I'm going to walk every day. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to go to the pool. I'm, I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to get my body in shape. I'm going to eat right. I'm going to quit this. I'm going to quit that. I'm going to add this. I'm going to subtract that. Because by addition, there's some things you're going to have to subtract. And I'm telling you, there are some warriors in this room right now. Some men and women of God. Some warriors that need to get their health back. Need to get their mind back. Need to get their finances back. Need to get their peace back. Need to get their life back. And I'm saying, you're going to have to keep pedaling. Endure. Endure. So I could say a thousand things about that. Certainly endurance could be a whole series. But I'm going to tell you why we're here and we're done. Stand with me, matter of fact, just so I'll quit. My, hand me my phone. I want to read something real quick. Hand me that, just, thank you. I wasn't going to preach on this this morning. There's a lady that uh, prays for my wife and I every week. Her name's Rebecca. She doesn't go to our church. She goes to the church in, outside of Hendersonville. I've known her since I was a child, literally since I was about 11 years old. She always prayed for me. And then when I got saved and called to preach, she was super excited. And then when I started preaching in the area, she was very excited. But she always told me one day the baptism of the Holy Spirit's going to hit you and wreck your whole life. And she was right. So every Sunday morning, 
She sends my wife and I a message on Facebook every Sunday morning. And she is one of the most prophetically gifted people in my life. And I have several in this room. And this morning she, she sent me this. Just, just out of the blue. Good morning. I'm praying over you and Ty and the church today. The Lord woke me with these words. The blessing of endurance. And then he said to me, endurance is noble. Endurance is like faith. So I pray today that the blessing of endurance be on and in you and the entire house today. Praying for all details in the name of Jesus. And some of you today should leave the comfort of your seat right now. Come to the steps of this altar and say, God, baptize me in a spirit of endurance. 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 Help me to just go one more day. Push one more mile. Give one more dollar. Pray one more prayer. Fast one more hour. Preach one more sermon. I couldn't tell you how many Monday morning resignation letters I have written and never turned in over the last 19 years of our church. I'm glad I never turned it in. Keep pressing. I I know what the bank account says. Keep pressing. I I know what the haters and detractors are saying about you. Keep pressing. I know you've been praying for 15 years for that son or daughter to come home. Keep praying. God gave my wife and I word a few years back when everything was pre-revival. Before crowds were showing up, before baptisms were happening by the thousands, before we had a internet ministry and books and movies, we'd pull into the church parking lot on Easter Sunday. If forty people showed up, I felt like Billy Graham. It was so small; nobody was coming. It was just, it was demoralizing. And I'm not against small churches. I preach in them every week. And I would roll up and cry for 30 minutes in the parking lot before I could even come in and shake anybody's hand. I couldn't even drink coffee. I was more nervous than the coffee was. I'd just, I'd sit in the car and just weep and cry and weep and cry and weep and cry. Sitting right in that little wedding chapel that's gone now. And one day the Lord spoke to both me and my wife, separate but on the same day. You know what the Lord said? Keep showing up. Keep showing up. Keep showing up. And I say that to all of you. Maybe there's some preachers in here today and you're just discouraged. Keep showing up. Keep showing up. Keep showing up. We were having our men's Bible study one day, one morning. And I can't wait to get back to men's Bible study. That's for sure. I miss it desperately. But we were having our men's Bible study one morning and we were in the little chapel. We were in the building. And Milo... He could tell I had been hurting. My family was hurting. Man, I was down. I didn't even know what deliverance was in those days. But I needed it. I was so depressed. And Milo walked up to me and he gave me something that I still have to this day. I still cherish it. He gave me a little piece of a rope. And at the end of that rope was a knot tied. And then the ends were singed and burnt off of it and melted into it. And he handed me that that morning, laid it on my Bible, and he said, Pastor, I can just, I can just tell that you're down. And, and he wasn't even flowing in the prophetic nearly as much as he does now with all of his dreams and the words God gives him, but he knew. And he said, Pastor, when you get to the end of your rope, just tie a knot and hold on. And every now and again, I'll open that drawer on my desk and I'll see that little knot. And God will remind me, just hold on, son. Better days are coming. 
Brighter days are coming. Miracles are coming. You know the best thing about a miracle in the Bible? There had to be a reason for one. We love to talk about miracles. We never talk about the reason for the miracle. There was a reason for the miracle signs and wonders. Nobody got resurrected from the dead unless they died. Nobody got fed unless they were hungry. No storms got called unless there was one. And we celebrate the miracle, but can we not today just celebrate the reason for the miracle? So you just take your time. You press in. Endure, 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 endure. If you're here to be baptized in the water today, step over here to the tub. Miss Billy and the crew is there. We'll get you a towel, get you a name tag, get you all ready to go. And we'll be willing to baptize you so you can follow the Lord and believers' obedience today. Today is your day to do that. But you take your time here. You pray. You need prayer? Slip your hand up. We'll get somebody to you. But endure, endure. Some of you today, even if you're not at the altar, some of you today, go home. Write something down this week. Say, you know what? I'm going to step out of my comfort zone. I'm going to do this. And very soon I'm going to talk about a covenant before the Lord. Because if, if you'll make a promise to me, you'll do it for a few days. If you'll make a covenant to God, you'll do it every single day. Because you'll walk in the fear of the Lord. And we're going to talk about what it means to make a covenant with the Lord. Make a covenant with the Lord. We got folks in the room right now that have done that. I think about Scott. I'm looking down here at Scott right now. Uh, Scott did a, a covenant a while back before the Lord. I won't give away all his thunder. He did a covenant. And one of the things he was going to do, he said, uh, when, when he gets to the end of his covenant, he wanted, to, he wanted to get so healthy on a bicycle. This man had been, been riding no bicycles. I helped him get one. He wanted to be so healthy. He said, you know what? By the end of this covenant, it was a 90-day covenant. At the end of this covenant, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ride my bicycle from my house in Lebanon all the way to the church campus. And right at the end of that thing, he come rolling up here, sweating like a wild man, rolled that bicycle all the way from Lebanon up. You say, well, I don't think that's very far. Y'all yeah, try it. It's a long ways. I do it often. Get out of your comfort zone. Just promise the Lord, today, Lord, today, show me something you want me to do. Show me this race that I am in, spiritually, physically, and in every other way. I'm telling you, God's got something for you to do. God's got warriors in this house, men and women alike, things he wants you to do, things only you can do. You don't run my race. Don't run her race. Don't run your spouse's race. Run your race with patience. With patience. So as these pray, I'm going to just turn the crowd loose. Just let them sing. Prophesy over us with music. We're going to go baptize some people. We never dismiss. We just say, we'll see you at the next appointed time. And unless we let you know otherwise, it'll be next Sunday. And we're just going to keep trusting the Lord. Going to keep just expecting and enduring for his provision. If it don't all come in the day, guess what? We get up tomorrow and endure. And then the next day we endure. And 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 finally, we've endured so much. The tent comes down. We go into the promised land. And God does something amazing. But we can't stop short of the miracle and the blessing of God. Amen, church. We can't stop short of it. So as they sing, you just worship, you get around, you love each other. We're going to have some baptisms. You want to stay for those and just let these folks pray. And we love you. Thank you for being here today. To God be the glory, great things he has and is doing.